in vacuum, initially created with a steam diffusion system. Our experience with vacuum firing and in the management of similar integrated system tests will aid us immeasurably in light testing of the lunar vehicle. In the area of attitude control, extremely vital for LEM, we're developing a space flight simulator, which we will use for the lunar excursion module. The three-ton, 52-foot-long simulator is mounted on a bearing which floats on friction-free cushion of air. Attitude rockets can maneuver the simulator in the pitch, yaw, and roll axes, allowing us to test attitude control systems under free-floating conditions. Our space research efforts have not been devoted solely to hardware. We are and have been actively engaged in human aspects of space flight, of determining the interface requirements between man and space vehicles. We've been operating the spacecraft simulator called Mars for a year to investigate biomedical, psychological, and engineering problems of manned space flight. It's equipped to simulate an entire space mission from launch to landing. With the simulator, we've developed and tested a working breadboard of a life support system. We're also working on such equipment as an onboard microchemical system, which will permit astronauts to check their physiological chemistry during prolonged confinement. During the past three years, we have invested over three and a quarter million dollars of company funds into studies directly related to the lunar mission. This is in addition to government-sponsored research into similar areas. In one of our studies, we used a simulator to investigate lunar landing techniques. The simulator consisted of pilot controls, pilot displays, and an analog computer to represent vehicle dynamics. Test pilots flew the mission. For the pilot controlling pitch and thrust, we concentrated on the landing approach to touchdown phase. We were interested specifically in determining the handling characteristics of the vehicle. In another study that bears on a lunar mission, we investigated the techniques required for rendezvousing and docking two spacecraft. We conducted this research last year to study the components and the techniques needed to accomplish these two critical phases of flight. The test proved the feasibility of our rendezvous and docking procedure and pointed up the need for adequate pilot displays. The seemingly simple matter of visibility of being able to identify a second vehicle in space could pose problems during rendezvous and docking. The target vehicle, suspended against a black void and lighted by an intense column beam of light, may not be a recognizable form to the pilot of the approaching vehicle. Instead, it may appear as a light source itself, without definition. We've been exploring the problems of space visibility and seeking their solutions. On the basis of preliminary experiments, we believe that with small models, we can inexpensively duplicate the same views that an astronaut will have of a second vehicle during rendezvous. With such model simulations, astronauts can be trained on the ground to identify what they are seeing in space. Our studies into this and other space visibility areas are continuing. To determine the effects of a space environment on proposed land materials, we sealed specimens for 15 days in a vacuum at 10 to the minus 8 millimeters of mercury. Our purpose was to determine changes, if any, in the optical properties of window materials and to measure the lap shear strains of Scotchwell. The vacuum had no significant detrimental effect on the window materials or the metal bond. In another vacuum test series, we subjected various paint specimens, organic and inorganic, to ultraviolet rays. Since paint is important in regulating the internal temperature of the vehicle, we are determining which type of paint best withstands radiation and vacuum of space. Our radiation research has not been entirely earthbound. In one company-funded project, underway since 1958, we have been using instrumented balloons to make high-altitude radiation measurements. In this continuing research, we are studying solar cosmic rays, especially low-energy gamma rays and high-energy X-rays. Portions of the Atlas 109D, the rocket used on the Glenn Orbital flight, were recovered in South America and Africa and returned to us for analysis. This may look like a magnified picture of a crater on the surface of the moon, but it's actually a pinhead-sized pit on an Atlas skin section caused, we believe, by a micrometeorite. 
The stainless steel skin sections were dotted with tiny craters, apparently caused by meteorites striking the atlas in space. Our engineers are studying the miniature craters to determine the size and velocities of the meteorites and to discover, if possible, the physical composition of the particles. For the past three years, we've concentrated on studies of meteors and their effects on space vehicles. To simulate meteorite impacts, we've employed a variety of techniques, from specially developed meteorite guns to the firing of pellets with explosives. The tests have yielded a wealth of information applicable to LEMS. At the Utah Research and Development Center in Salt Lake City, we conducted additional meteorite tests to support our planning for the LEM structure. In the test series, we used samples of metals, insulations, and transparent materials, which we were considering for the lunar vehicle. The tests were conducted in a vacuum environment, using 1 8 inch diameter aluminum pellets to simulate the meteorite particles. We've incorporated the test results into the design of the LEM cabin structure and cabin windows. Our objective in the LEM design was to make the pilot feel at home, even though operating in a hostile environment. A natural transition from aircraft to spacecraft. Crew safety depends primarily on a crew members responding correctly and quickly to given cues. The cues may be exterior or interior, or both. To assure the right responses, visibility, control, and display requirements were integrated. Crew tasks were carefully analyzed. Crew positions were given top priority. Side-by-side -side seating with the commander on the left and the systems engineer on the right yields optimum communication by sight sound, and touch. Flight management displays are centered, readily visible by either man. Systems panels are within easy reach. The systems engineer has dual flight controls to provide greater crew safety and greater assurance of mission success. The engineer can take over flight functions instantly if the commander is incapacitated for any reason, such as a meteorite strike or nausea. At any point in the mission, the crew can jettison the descent stage by flipping this guarded switch. Independently, if any malfunction should occur to the main engine, the commander can jettison the descent stage, shut down the main engine, ignite and bring his standby engines to power, all without removing his hand from the power lever. This capability for rapid positive action is important to crew safety in the hover mode. Limb hovering and landing design considerations were a natural evolution from helicopter and VTO pogo techniques. The main engine control, operated by the left hand, is analogous to the helicopter collective pitch control used for controlling altitude. Attitude control in pitch and roll is accomplished with the attitude control stick held in the right hand and is comparable to a helicopter control stick. Foot pedals, similar to helicopter rudder pedals, provide azimuth control. The arrangement of controls and display panels was developed from studies of normal viewing angles and convenience of reach. Restrictiveness of pressure suits, headgear clearances, restrained harnesses, and access to and from the seated position were considered. A simple probe drogue technique, already familiar to pilots, was adopted for the docking maneuver. This semi-hard, self-aligning system requires no reorientation of either crew member, their cues, or their controls. Vehicle translation using this reaction engine control makes docking a straightforward operation. The crew has excellent visibility for the initial docking maneuver using the forward window. Final docking is monitored through the overhead port as the limb is rotated for final mate with the command module. A probe drogue docking procedure, side-by-side -side seating, dual flight controls, and a multiple engine configuration were chosen to ensure first-time crew safety and mission success. <laughs>